If you are able, please rise and join in the call to worship. Let us bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in our mouths. The Lord guides the humble to hear and to be glad. The Lord's ways are faithfulness and love. Rejoice in the Lord and let us exalt his name together. Let us join now in the singing of O Day of Rest and Gladness, hymn number 393. Let us express our sins to the Lord together. Gracious Lord, far too many times we have tried to hide our faces and shield our hearts from you. We have worked against your purposes, a loving and equitable world. We have sinned against you by abandoning hope, by failing to hear and heed your promises by relying on ourselves to be the source and object of our own faith. Forgive us, we pray, for our negligent behavior and our errant acts, and restore us to faith in your provincial care and guiding love. Hear the good news. When we abide in Christ and his words reside in us, we know the joys of salvation. Amen. Amen.
Our first reading from the Bible this morning is Psalms 37, 1 through 13. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of the wrongdoers. For soon they will fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindications shine like the light, and the justices of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that their day is coming. Our second reading this morning is Romans 10, 1 through 4, and 14 to 17. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. I can testify that they have a zeal for God, but it is not enlightened. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. But how are they to call on one one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard? And how are they 
they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. But not all have obeyed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. The word of the Lord. A dozen games remain in the regular baseball season, and baseball fever has reached a fever pitch in Southern California. The Dodgers intensify their prolonged chase of their arch rival and season surprising giants, and Shohei Otani of the Angels has fi fans fired up about his batting battle with Vladimir Guerrero for the home run crown and the MVP honors. With baseball, and I fumbled. <laughs> With baseball as a theme running through this morning's sermon, I join a roster of other ministers and theologians who have confessed their baseball fervor in worship and aligned it with their Christian faith. About a decade ago, in a series of sermons on the kingdom of God, Presbyterian minister James Curry harmonized vignettes from baseball history with several of Jesus' parables, including the prodigal son. In one message, Reverend Curry aligned the joy of the receptive, forgiving father with the sheer delight often exhibited in baseball. He celebrated the ebullient spirit of Ernie Banks, whose mantra was, it's a great day for a ball game, let's play two. And he cited uh, the display of joyful Ozzie Smith, who bounded to his shortstop position by doing a couple of leaping somersaults. Curry suggested that the joy of baseball can provide a foretaste of the joy fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And about a half century before Curry's series of sermons, former Brooklyn pastor Herbert Redmond strikingly connected baseball and faith during the liturgy, while former Dodgers first baseman Gil Hodges was mired in the worst, season, worst slump of his career during the 1952 World Series. The Reverend Redmond rose to deliver the homily and simply declared, it's far too hot for a sermon. Keep the commandments and say a prayer for Gil Hodges. <laughs> now, you might hope that today's sermon will be so direct and succinct, <laughs> but I assure you it won't be. Among the books in my library that connect baseball and religion, some have tantalizing titles like Sermon on the Mound or When Faith Steals Home or a third, And God Said Play Ball. This last one plays with the opening verse in Genesis in the big inning God created. It does. For the most part, these journalistic accounts present a lighthearted comparison between baseball and religion, while others record inspiring Christian testimonies of major league players. Yet more provocative and profound than these baseball and religion books is one by theologian John Sexton. In his book, Baseball as a Road to God, he tries to show how baseball, like faith, can reveal the deepest passions of our innermost selves. Sexton understands that baseball is more than a game.
While it's certain that he does not believe that baseball can substitute for the reconciliation facilitated through Christ, he does affirm that the experience and understanding of baseball can be an effective means for talking about faith, especially to students and readers who might be apathetic toward religion or reluctant to talk about it. In that way, Sexton acts in concert with Paul's rationale for Christian mission, which the apostle articulated in the passage from Romans that we read earlier. Paul introduces his reason for Christian outreach by posing a series of questions, here rendered in the language of the today's English version. Paul asks the Romans, how shall people gain confidence in God if they do not engage with God? And how shall they know how to engage with God unless someone shows them a way to do so? Building on these questions, Paul urged the believers in Rome to reach out to other people whose backgrounds and cultures and languages were different from their own. While Paul presented this rationale for mission without any reference to sports, in other letters he displayed a deep appreciation for games by using metaphors about racing and boxing to illustrate the goal and discipline of faith. <clears throat> in his first letter to the church in Corinth, he implored the Christians with these words. Do you know that in a race, the runners all compete, but that only one wins the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things but while they do it to receive a perishable wreath, we as believers pursue an imperishable one. Although we know Paul at times compared aspects of Christian life with these sports, I am absolutely sure that he could not have anticipated the alignment of his rationale for missions with baseball especially since the first baseball games were played 18 centuries after his death. Even so, let's consider this. Is it not appropriate to apply the logic of his message to baseball fans and players who constitute a distinct culture with a language of their own? Don't they need to be shown how to engage God Sexton suggests that baseball provides a vehicle to explain faith to partic the particular audience of baseball fans. In response, he taught an annual seminar, Baseball as a Road to God, and he wrote the book as a means of outreach, a chance to share the wonder of faith with students and readers who may have been indifferent or hostile to discussions about faith. As he puts it, baseball offers a window into the nature of faith, even in the deepest meanings of the word, as a source of comfort, of motivation, of understanding, and above all, of meaning and ultimate purpose. And he concludes that there are moments when baseball can lift us from the ordinary to a different plane. When baseball does lift us beyond the mundane, the extraordinary experience can be described as ecstatic. A unique baseball example of such an ineffable experience was Kurt Gibson's limping off home run to stun Dennis Eckersley and the uh, Oakland A's in the first game of the 1988 World Series. That game-winning hit with two outs and two strikes in the bottom of the ninth 
generated a sense of euphoria in Dodger Stadium and throughout the reach of Ben Scully's broadcast voice. But unique plays are not the only ones that can create such an amazing experience. Think of the multiple occasions when Mike Trout has leapt above the center field fence and reached back to rob a slugger of a home run, a spectacular snare that he seems to repeat at least once a year. Even so, each of his sensational catches excites baseball lovers and transports them, especially Angel fans, to a different realm. Such an extraordinary experience occurs when and where faith comes into play. Eminent theologian Paul Tillich has described faith as the state of being ultimately concerned. That dense phrase requires some unpacking, the state of being ultimately concerned. And here, another baseball analogy might help to explain things. Former all-star pitcher Jim Bouton, whose major league career expanded 16 years, wrote a bestseller about baseball culture. In it, he reflected on his devotion to baseball. You spend a great deal of your life gripping a baseball, and in the end, it turns out that it was the other way all around. Baseball was gripping you. The same can be said of faith. The state of being ultimately concerned means that instead of having faith or selecting faith, faith has you. Faith is the deep-centered act of a person that arises out of a full commitment, a commitment so powerful that it envelops one's entire being, one's entire life. A person's faith directs life. And the experience of opening oneself to an ineffable connection is an awakening of faith. An ineffable connection? Perhaps one that is sampled with one of the baseball miracle plays that we've referenced. Faith is an ecstatic experience that is all-embracing. It is unspeakably, it is an unspeakably joyful connection to the transcendent that transforms life. Now, at the end of his book, Sexton confesses that baseball really isn't a road to God because God is already here, already there, already with us. Yet, Sexton recognizes that baseball can generate experiences that align with faith. He concludes, if we open ourselves to the rhythms and intricacies of the game, and if we allow the timelessness and intensity of the game's most magnificent moments to shine through, the resulting heightened sensitivity might give us a sense of the ineffable, the transcendent, the presence of God already with us and in us, for we are created in the image of God. That's amazing. Through baseball, we might learn to experience life more deeply. More than a game, baseball can provide a vehicle to discern and discuss faith, the state of being ultimately concerned. And about such faith, a 19th century hymn has put it prayerfully well. Lord, 
Give me such a faith as this, and then whate'er may come, I'll know while here this hallowed bliss of my eternal home. Amen. We come now to the time of sharing uh, of our offerings and tithes. For those of you who are worshiping at home uh, and would like to contribute, there are ways to do so, uh, either by sending something to the church office or by going to the bottom of the, uh, the church's website uh, homepage and there clicking on uh, the, the PayPal link that will enable a donation to be made. But let us pray as we prepare to offer our tithes and offerings. Eternal source of good and of all that we enjoy, we give thanks for the opportunity to share our resources in support of the work of your kingdom. For this we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. We thank you for the opportunities to give and to respond responsibly with resources for the work of this church and your kingdom. For this we pray. Amen. We come now to the time for sharing of joys and concerns, and there are some joys that we continue to have with the opportunities to serve uh, with the food bank that uh, has been set up. Uh, Patty has a sign-up sheet out on the patio where you can sign up to volunteer. Volunteers are needed, but we need to be able to coordinate who is here at what times, uh, so your sign-up would be uh, most appreciated. Um, and next Sunday will be a chance also to bring food for the, uh, the food collection uh, that we have. There are concerns that are also have been expressed. This week we have learned from Joan Loth that Martin is improving with his uh, COVID case and she herself has now tes tested uh, uh, negative uh, on two occasions so she is uh, now without uh, the risk of having uh, been infected. Uh, he is, continues to be in isolation, but he is improving. Are there other joys or concerns that you would like to uh, make known at this time? Thankful that the sermon didn't last nine innings. Thank you, Patty. Let us pray. Remembering the, the expressed concerns and calling to mind others that lie deep within our hearts, we ask for their Support, O oh God, and we beseech your blessing upon them. We give thanks for the times that we can celebrate play and when we play, pray. We feel enlivened by the freedoms that we experience when we play and cheer at games, and our hearts are made light as we are lifted up on those occasions but we are also saddened in many ways by the reports of recent days of increased crime during the pandemic and of the wildfires that continue to ravage California and the West. We pray for all people who have suffered from the hateful acts committed with weapons. We pray for those who are fighting the fires on the ground and in the air and with various technological means to anticipate how they can best protect your grieving world. For those who are grieving loss of loved ones and friends, we pray our comfort during these trying days, especially during the time of Pastor Steve's father-in-law's hospice care. While we invoke your counsel and comfort on the victims of various acts and those who have been dislocated and displaced from their homes, we also pray for those among us who are threatened by the various, various restrictions imposed by the, vi by the virus, enables us to work with these restrictions in constructive ways. In your love, embrace those who endure hurt and pain that they may know that they can turn to you with their burdens. And we thank you for opportunities to play in games that can enrich our lives and distract us momentarily from some of the 
troubles that we face. We thank you for prompting us to think about our faith. We pray that you will open our eyes to see you more clearly. We pray for physical, emotional, and spiritual healing. We pray for those who are grieving a loss. We offer thanks for your sending your spirit to guide us. We offer our hearts for you to change. We offer ourselves to be your hands, feet, and voices. And we offer this prayer as Jesus taught his disciples, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join now together in the singing of our closing hymn, O God, in whom all life begins, Hymn number 308. Depart now to enjoy the chance to play and cheer. And as you go, remember, by God's creative power, you have been born into this world. By God's providential care, you have been sustained all the day long, even to this very hour. 
and by the amazing grace of God fully revealed in the face of Jesus, you are being redeemed. Amen. <laughs>